Hi, everyone. It's good to be back. Hello, church family, and hello, new people. I really hope there are some new people out there. Um, I just wanted to say something about um, the preparation of this message um, because it was a little bit um, of a struggle for me in some ways. Last week, we talked a lot about victory and victory from the cross and the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, usually when I try to prepare a message, I try to do it prayerfully. I, I want it to be the Holy Spirit. I don't want it to be me. And after I finished my outline and I started going over it, I realized that it was very, uh, not the same, but similar. And it seemed like the Lord took me down different paths. And I was almost thinking, did I need to just put this aside and start over? And then I felt a very strong prompting in my spirit that I was supposed to do this. So I think God does that a lot, that he really wants to drive a message home to us. He really wants us to get it. I know he does with me. So um, it seems that um, during this time of quarantine and uh, COVID virus going on around us, um, it seems that I've really had a lot in my heart about the people who are so lost, people that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And also, um, God has put on my heart um, new people. Um, I was thinking about how just before this all happened and our church had to close down and we all had to distance ourselves and uh, stay isolated, that we did have a lot of new people coming into the church and people that had accepted Christ. And I was thinking about how important discipleship is. And um, I'm so grateful that we have these podcasts and we have a live sermon on Sundays because we really need to be fed. And I was just thinking about how we really can't disciple those new people the way we normally would, the things that would be available to them if the church were open. Sunday morning, we have a Bible study geared just for them. We have community groups. We have um, the coffee cafe where we try to invite people to come on in and have a cup of coffee. We have pizza with the pastors where we can introduce ourselves and learn a little about, bit about each other. And it's just so important that we be fed. And as we feed our physical bodies, we need to feed our spiritual bodies. So before I do get into my message, I would like to just say a short prayer, if that's okay. And Father God, I just ask in the name of Jesus that the message that is spoken today be totally guided by your Holy Spirit. I want there to be nothing of me, Lord. It's all about you. And Lord, if there's even one person out there that can be reached, can be delivered from some um, adverse situation that they're in, then it's all worth it. And Lord, I know that you know every single person out there already. You know every heart and you know how to minister. So we're just asking that you, Lord, would send your Holy Spirit out and soften hearts, open eyes, open ears, and we just give it all to you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Now, as I mentioned I, last week, I talked a lot about victory from the cross and the crucifixion. And I was also thinking about how, you know, we're a few weeks past Easter, but always the weeks that precede Easter are such a time of meditating on the cross, really thinking about what Jesus did for us. I know that's true for me, and I'm sure it's true for many of you. Holy Week, we focus so much on the crucifixion. And, you know, there is no way to minimize how Jesus suffered for us. It is a horrendous thing to think about sometimes, but we it's good for us to um, really think about it. You know, I can remember as a kid seeing all kinds of crucifixes with Jesus on the cross, and he had a crown of thorns and a drop of blood. That, no way, no way does that really paint the picture of what he went through. He, uh, from the time he was arrested, he was um, harassed, he was mocked, he was hit, he was spit upon, they pulled out his beard, they tore off his clothes, they um, mocked him, calling him king of the Jews. 
Little did they know he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords over all. And then the horrendous uh, scourging, the flogging with that terrible uh, cat of nine tails. And that cat of nine tails was a whip with leather strips and it had either bone or um, iron studs at the end that tore the flesh. And uh, the horrible beating he took, the pain we can't even imagine. And then on those painful shoulders, they thrust that heavy cross and forced him to walk to Calvary. And he fell and they called Simon of Cyrene from the side of the road to carry the cross behind Jesus. And to me, that is symbolic of us picking up our cross and following him to the cross and surrendering to him, just as he surrendered to the Father. Um, those nails, those spikes that were driven into him uh, and just being raised up and it's so painful. Uh, it's, a, it's sometimes a very hard picture. Uh, most of the time when I do meditate it, I just wind up crying because I'm so grateful for what he did. But you know, I thought about the fact that as horrible as that was, that time at the cross, that was not the, the hardest battle that Jesus fought. That was the conclusion of the battle and the victory at the cross. But the true battle was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when we think about the horrible agony that Jesus went through trying to make this choice to surrender to his Father. It, it's quite amazing the suffering that he did even in the garden. And you know in Luke 22, 42 and 44 the scripture says this, Jesus is saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat came like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And you know, I think again, every covenant with the Father is a blood covenant. And there again, even his sweat came forth like blood. And not my will, but thy will be done. That's what we all need to say. But have you ever thought about what would it have been like if Jesus had said no? What if he had said, Father, I can't do this. This is just too hard. I just want to come back to heaven and be with you. I don't want to do this. So let's leave these people on their own and take me home now. What if? This world would have been just unthinkable. I mean, it's amazing when you think about it. There would have been such corruption. There would have been no, no belief in God. There would have been um, no churches, no Christianity. There would have been no hope. People wouldn't even know what hope or faith or joy was all about. And the sin would have been so prevalent that when you think about the greed and power and everything that would have been taking place, it just would have been awful. Now it's kind of sad that today this world is in a mess and we kind of get a little glimpse of that, of course not to that degree, but what the world is like without Jesus compared to our walking with him and being in that spiritual world. We really are in a spiritual world with the Lord and uh, you know people just turn away from everything and uh, the good news is that Jesus is alive and we have a life centered on him and as I was preparing for today and gathering my thoughts I found once more that I was inspired by my pastors and that's good right there were two things. Uh, one was Pastor Susie um, gave a message on joy last week, and it just really um, impressed me that she spoke about when she reminded us that our joy is not contingent 
and our circumstances or things. It's not things that we own or what we can achieve, how much money, how good our house is, um, even you know, dependency on people or putting expectations on people. Our happiness cannot come from that. It is only through that intimate relationship with Jesus that these things are available to us. Uh, the joy and the peace and the love, those things come from a relationship with Him. And then there was Pastor Mike, and what an awesome sermon it was last week. And I am a person that loves visuals. And when Pastor Mike was outside hefting those cinder blocks to explain to us the importance of Jesus being the cornerstone in our lives, not just a block in the wall, that he has to be first. Everything in our lives should center around Jesus Christ. Otherwise, he's not first. And we're not going to have that victory when he's not first. So that impacted me. I thought about how these two things are connected because oftentimes when I am praying for people who are hurting so badly, who are going through uh, such discouragement and devastation and depression and all of those things that really cause them to be so far down. They want to know how. How do I overcome this? How do I get out of this? Um, and you know, it seems almost a little bit trite when we sometimes say to them, I'll pray for you, but we don't do it right then and there. Or we might say, um, this too shall pass. Or we might say, um, we need to get over it and get on with it. Or we might say, let go and let God. And those things are sound, solid things that we serve. They're goals we want to accomplish. But the question is how? And sometimes when we say those things to a person that is hurting so badly, it's not very helpful to them. So how do they find that ability to regain the joy and the hope and the peace? And the answer, of course, is Jesus Christ as Pastor Mike talked about, really putting him first and allowing him to be your all in all. I'd like to read a couple of scriptures verse, verses here pertaining to hope. Um, number one, we have to remember that we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus on the cross. And 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth. That's our born again experience when we truly receive Christ as our Savior. Having that fullness, having the Holy Spirit, having everything we need to be overcomers to be taken above these circumstances. And then we need also to remember that trusting in the God of hope will bring you yet more joy and peace and hope. In Romans 15, 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God has given us everything we need. And we, the answer is we must have a surrendered relationship with Jesus and experience that new birth. And that new birth gives us a hunger and a thirst to be in the Word. The Word is so, so important. And in John 7, 37 and 38, it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit there and how important the word is. And you I want to really encourage you 
when you go to the Word and when you pray, ask first for the Holy Spirit to come, to be your teacher. It tells us in the Word, Jesus promises us that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. He will be our guide. He will take us into all truth. So, you know, if we're just reading the Word um, and not really taking it in, we're not going to get that victory. You remember I told you I love visuals. Well, God knows that I love visuals too, and it's always amazing to me. Um, in my prayer time, and I'm not saying that I'm a visionary and that I'm getting these wonderful visions appearing before me, but God knows that I love visions, and I have so often found in my prayer time that when I close my eyes and I begin to pray, it's almost like God gives me this little picture. And there's two things that keep reoccurring. And I know that when they do, um, there's a reason God wants me to pray on these things. He wants me to think about these things. He wants me to take these things into my heart. So the first one is almost like a divided TV screen or movie screen. And on the right side, it's kind of depressing. The right side of that screen is the world and it's just full of lost people. People that are hurting so badly, people that are so confused, people that are lost. I see people that are suffering with addictions, um, drug addictions, alcohol, um, sex, gambling. You know all the things I'm talking about. And um, God shows me all of this and I know that it's because he wants me to pray. Now these are perfect strangers, people I don't even know, but I pray for them and God knows who they are. There are a few that I know, so. But on the right side of the screen is a picture of Jesus taking all these people into his arms, just calling people out of that darkness and into his light and they're coming and their faces are just so bright. They're coming to him and his arms are open and the joy and the peace is just so evident in them and, and it's such a good feeling. And I always try to think that, yes, Lord, you're gonna take those people out of the darkness and you're gonna bring them into your light and they're gonna know that peace and that joy and come into that spiritual world. And the second visual, I repeatedly see is interesting and it's it seems to be three different groups of people and the first group I see are very strong solid Christians and a lot of them are my church family hello out there and there are faces I recognize and people I see and I just feel such joy when I see this and um, I know that we have a strong bond, this church family. Uh, we have a strong bond of unity and of being in one accord. And we, I know that no matter what adversity comes to any one of us, whether it, it be sickness, something in our family, if it's a relationship, if it's a financial problem, we can always come together. And we do. We come together in prayer and we lift each other up and we encourage each other and we, we pray through till we get to that place of hope and peace and joy. And uh, the, the second group is very sad. Um, it's a, a group of people, again, who are completely lost. They don't want to know anything about God. They don't want to talk about God. They don't go to church. They have no faith, they're totally rebellious. And again, those are the lost. And then there's a third group, and this group can be a little dangerous too because I don't know what you would call them, maybe mediocre or comfortable Christians where they say they believe. Uh, they believe in Jesus, but they don't walk with him. They don't really have any kind of a relationship with him. Um, they don't go to church, they don't want to get involved, um, there's no way of serving, uh, none of that is on their mind. He's somewhere in there, kind of like what Pastor Mike talked about with the building blocks. He's in there somewhere, but it's not, 
he's not been put in the place that he should be. And um, those are the people that really need to uh, realize, when you think about it, Satan believes too. He knows Jesus. He knows he's real. But that doesn't mean that he's surrendered to him or following him. He's battling him every step of the way. So uh, when you think about this too, um, you know, for these people, going to church is not a priority. Reading the word is not a priority. They don't realize the things that do give them victory. You see, these things are so important in order for us to overflow with that hope of the power of the Holy Spirit, as it said in Romans 15, 13. And when you think about how important the word is, I would encourage you, if you just want a little activity to do, go to your Bible concordance and look up word and words. It is astounding how many times uh, it is spoken in the Bible, how many times we can pull it up. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your words are like honey to my lips. Um, there's just one after the other, encouraging, but showing us how important, how important that word is for us. And now one of the ones I just love is the parable of the sower. And uh, the, the parable of the sower, I'll just paraphrase, um, some what fell by the way. It's about a sower going out to sow his seed, and some falls by the wayside, some falls by the rock, some falls on um, hard ground, some falls on, in the thorns, and some falls on fertile soil. But now in uh, Luke, Jesus explains the parable, and he says, now the parable is this, the seed of, the seed is the word of God. And those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes it away. It takes, he takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rack are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, but it doesn't take any root, it has no root. And they believe for a while, but in time of temptation, fall away. Now the ones who fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fall on good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble in good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So that's just so important. Um, we need, you know, we unless we are fed and take these things into us, um, we can never um, grow. I love Isaiah 55:11, where it says, "So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth; it shall not return to me void." but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now, when we're speaking the word, we're praying the word, we're sending the word out. When we pray over people, pray scripture. It's powerful. And that word is going out and will not return void. It's a promise of God. He will use it, and he will work it for his will. In Proverbs 18.21, one of my favorite scriptures, tells us death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. We need to be in the word, speak the word, take it into our hearts, uh, claim it, proclaim it, and it will um, give us the weapon that we need. You know, in, um, in Ephesians 6, where we talk about the armor of God, that scripture that says uh, the word of God is the, whole, is the sword of the spirit. It's our weapon to fight with. Now, have you ever experienced reading God's word and sometimes something you're reading will really hit you, it will really impact you, and then suddenly some, you just seem to forget about it. 
At other times you might read the word and it's like um, you finish and you say, I feel like I didn't really get anything out of that. But then somewhere down the road, there's some adversity that comes into your life, some situation that all of a sudden that scripture springs forth like living water. And sometimes you didn't even know you knew that scripture or you don't know where it came from. But that's the way the Holy Spirit works. And it's... Um, it's a wonderful thing. God is just so good. And it's because we have chosen. We have chosen to go to him. Which, uh, that's when we find that peace settling over us, is when we use the word. Now, Pastor asked a question last week. He asked if um, any of us have ever experienced joy in the midst of a trial. And he also asked if anyone had ever commented on the fact that they could see joy in us when we were in the midst of a trial. And um, I began, and Susie's message also, when she finished her message about joy, I began to think about and ask myself, what are some of the circumstances I've been in that I, I really did experience this joy? And you know, I can tell you that in my life, I was just 77 years old on Monday, by the way. In 77 years, I have experienced many, many miracles, supernatural miracles, divine intervention from God. Then there are times where there may just be adversity where you experience joy, and that too is a miracle. But I started reflecting on um, what I might just share with you. Sometimes I think our greatest witness is a, a testimony about ourselves, something we can share with somebody and, that, and they can relate to it. They can see, see that God did it for you. He will do it for me. And um, it's funny because as I was reflecting on what I would like to speak about, um, Another story came into my mind that had nothing to do with me or my story, but as I thought about it, I realized how much it related to my story. And not only related, but was such a contrast to my story. And it's a short little story, but my husband was Italian. He was in an all-Italian family. And he had the sweetest little grandmother that came here from Italy as a young woman, but she had very old-fashioned customs. And God bless her, she lived to be 102 years old, and I used to love to sit and talk to her. When she was younger, she never really learned English. She um, spoke Italian always, and she um, would start talking to me in English and then it would just fall back into Italian and I couldn't understand. So I would have to call upon my mother-in-law. But one thing that amazed me, and it was not only her, a lot of her sisters came here too, and she um, always wore black. And my mother-in-law told me some stories about Italy that when somebody lost their spouse, lost a loved one, went into mourning, it was a really big deal. And she told me how they actually hired professional mourners to come to the funerals. I don't know if any, maybe some of you are familiar with this. I know, I, I think I've seen it in some old movies too. And they just wail and moan and cry and faint and fall in the casket and fall in the ground. And they get the whole family just bawling their eyes out. And sad to say, it doesn't end after the funeral. It can go on for months and even years. And I know my husband's grandmother always wore black. And she wore the shawl, and many times she would wear the veil. And it was almost sacrilegious to have any fun. And you burned candles uh, for the deceased and all this ritual. And, you know, I, I'm not... Um, 
criticizing her in any way. I know that was her culture, that's the way she was brought up, that's what she understood, but I couldn't help thinking, why? Why would anybody want to stay in that state? And what a contrast it is when you have Jesus and you have his strength and you have his love. And the story I thought about was when my mom passed away and my mom lived to be 89 and I had a very, very close relationship with her. She was such a special lady. And the last year of her life, she really struggled with congestive heart failure and uh, was in and out of the hospital. They would always have to drain the fluid and uh, they would get her a little better and then she'd go back. And the doctors explained to me that every time she has an episode, it's gonna affect her heart and her body organs. And so finally, toward the end of that year, um, she was in the hospital and I got a call and the doctor said she doesn't have much time left. So my sister at that time, I only have one sister and she was living in Syracuse. I called her and I said, try to get here as soon as you can. Mom is not good. And I went to the hospital and I was at her bedside holding her hand and even then there was this atmosphere because she loved the Lord with her whole heart and she was in a semi-coma and she was talking and she kept saying, I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus, over and over again. And at one point I wanted to just break through and let her know that I was there. So I, I said, Mom, it's Carol, I'm here. And she did recognize me and she said she loved me. And then she went right back to praising the Lord. And then she just peacefully, peacefully went to sleep. And I know she just was in Jesus' arms. And I knew she was gone. And I am not gonna lie to you and say that all oh, my peace and joy was instantaneous, it wasn't. I will never forget the, the pain in my heart when I knew she was gone and I wasn't gonna see her in this life anymore. It just hurt so bad. And they let me stay with her for a while, and then I had to go out into the waiting room. And uh, then my sister came, and we sobbed together, we cried together, but immediately we began to realize we needed to pray together. And as soon as we did that, as I'm not gonna say the pain went away, and grief is really a season of healing. It doesn't happen instantly but I did feel a peace settle over me. And I have to tell you that from the time she passed in the hospital to the time we went through preparing for the wake and the funeral, there truly was a peace and a joy because my sister and I were praying together and we were speaking the word of God. We were reminding ourselves of every scripture that assured us we get that blessed assurance of knowing where my mother was, knowing that she was with the Lord, knowing that we would see her again. We were just quoting all the scriptures we could think of that would affirm these things for us. And I, it's almost a little embarrassing that at the funeral home, um, the, the, the receiving line had kind of gone through, gone through, and there was a lull. And my sister and I were standing by the casket and when I tell you my mom was so special, she was such a funny lady. She made us laugh all the time, and we had so many stories. And uh, we were at the casket, and we started reminiscing. And we got silly, and we started laughing. And then all of a sudden, I realized we better regain our composure. We look kind of ridiculous. But do you know that there were people, there were relatives and friends that did come up and ask me afterwards, how can you be so strong? How could you even find laughter and joy? I know how much you loved your mother. And then there is an open door for you to tell them exactly why you have this joy. So that was just a, a very special time. And that was the story that came to my mind when I said, what should I cheer, share? So, so that is the message. I really and truly hope that um, people out there received from this, but I just want to close with one quick thing because as I said in the beginning, I kind of struggled with this message 
And God is so good. He just is so loving. Um, right after I finished this outline and prepared the message, I, I know a lot of you know Dr. Charles Stanley's um, In Touch magazine, the devotions, I just love it. I went to the devotion on Friday, and I, if I could just read this, I'm not going to read the scripture. It is it's from Psalm 27, but it says, Where do you go for help? when storms come into your life. Trouble has a way of drawing our focus downward to the immediate situation rather than upward to the Lord who reigns over every event in our life, every event. Therefore, our first response to trials should be to open the Bible and find out what God has said. Isn't that amazing? And when we focus our attention on the Lord and His promises, it's like throwing wood on the fire of our spiritual life, which helps us face whatever challenges come our way. However, because we have a tendency to let worry and fear slip back in, we must continue to add the fuel to the fire by repeatedly filling our minds, filling our minds with truth, from God's word. Although storms have many origins, there is only one answer for all of them. When everything around us comes unglued and falls apart, we must go to our knees, trusting the Lord to give us a sense of assurance, that blessed assurance and boldness to stand firm in obedience, a yielded life that's settled in God's word, open to his work within us and made adequate in the Holy Spirit. Love and power is immovable in the tempests of life, in the tempests of life. And to be double amazing, just before I came over here today, I read um, today's message, and I'm not going to read it all, but um, the title of the message was um, The Battle of in the garden, and it speaks of the garden of Gethsemane, that the battle was not on the cross, the battle was in the garden. And so it was just like, thank you, God. It was like he gave me a little stamp of approval, not for me, but for being obedient. So I thank you all, and I hope to see you again.